Welcome back in, everybody, to Birds 365, a Thursday edition, and we are joined now by the great, great friend of the program, John Stolness. John, thanks for joining us, man. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. What's up, bud? Um, hey, hey. I, I, you know, I was just reading Adam Schefter, who was on 97.5, and he was talking about Howie and how he manipulates the draft board, and he it brought up a, 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 a good point. If I said to John Stolness before the draft, that uh, the Eagles would come out of it with Quinion Mitchell and Cooper DeGene and three future picks. What would your reaction have been to that? Uh, probably no shot, right? <laughs> yeah, no shot. Um, and you would have to just assume that there was a healthy bit of luck that the board fell Howie's way again, and that he had a good read on on what other teams are doing. And so it's a nice combination of hard work by knowing and making phone calls and I you heard in the days leading up to the draft that how I was calling everybody trying to figure out if there were ways to move up where he might need to move up to it seemed like they had a cornerback in the back of their minds for their first round pick and uh, things just fell the way they did and and you know how he's gotten lucky in the last couple of drafts with with players falling down to areas where he didn't think he'd be able to get them and so you know yeah I mean it's just the draft couldn't have gone any better for, for Roseman. And I think we said that last year for him as, as well. Now that just needs to translate into production on the field, but in, in terms of getting value and getting players in, in spots where you didn't think you'd get them and at positions where you actually needed a lot of help. Yeah. And I couldn't have gone any better. Yeah. Howie's just really been amazing at getting the value out of the draft where we, me and John continue to go back to the Cooper DeGene move of, of in the second round, you wait to 40 then you pounce, Denver trades out, and four cornerbacks go. Just tremendous, tremendous reading of the board there. But I just want to get your opinion on a couple of the players. Uh, we can start in that round one with Quinion Mitchell. What do you think of the player? Um, any concern with where he played in school? Any concern with the player? Or are you happy with that pick? What do you think of, of Quinion Mitchell? Yeah, you know, I I mean, I, I certainly think uh, – I do I get to watch I don't get to watch, watch a lot of college football but in the in the weeks Especially leading up to, yeah. weeks leading up you certainly kind of get caught up on some of the guys who you think you know could be targets and everything you read about him is I don't worry as much about him that he's from Toledo because uh, he does have some tape against some top-notch players Marvin Harrison yeah. Jr obviously played him pretty well um, it sure seems like in terms of cornerback prospects, he's about as polished as, as you can get coming out of college. There, there are some areas of his game where it seems like he's, he's not quite as fluid maybe as, as some other cornerbacks, but he's got all the physical tools. He's got the speed, uh, could use a little work. I think with his hands, he's a lot of pass breakups would like to see maybe in the NFL, turn those into some more interceptions, but you know, generally speaking, it looks as though he's one of those guys that will be a cornerback one, and it won't take a whole lot of time for him to be able to develop into that kind of a player. And it's good that he's coming to a secondary where Darius Slay's got that spot locked up. James Bradbury, I think, is going to have the opportunity to start as CB2 this year. I, I don't anticipate him not being on the team by the time training camp or the regular season rolls around. And, um, you know, when you bring Avante Maddox back and you've got CJ GJ in the mix, he'll probably play some slot, but mostly safety. We don't know it's a good place for him to learn. It's a good place for him to be productive in his rookie season, but at the same time, he's not thrust into a starting spot. It doesn't seem like at this point. Now, maybe they maybe they decide to move on from James Bradbury before then, but I don't, I don't anticipate that. So Quinion, Quinion Mitchell is, a, it, no one thought he would go where he went. It's, it's phenomenal. They were able to get him when they did. And, you know, we'll see how it plays out. They've got to develop some of these guys. You know, that's a big part of this is like, can the coaching staff develop these guys, get these guys to be productive NFL players. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Yeah. I'm glad you said that, John, because I think uh, a lot of fans go, you either draft a good or a bad player and that's it. And, and really, you know, no, you got to get yeah. somebody in the building and you got to develop them and you got to get them uh, up to speed and up to reaching their potential. Um, and the Bradbury part of what you said is interesting because you're one of the few people, and I hope you're right, by the way, that the Eagles keep James Bradbury. I've been saying it. I think he's a perfect fit for Big Fangio um, because he's so smart. He's so savvy. He understands zone coverage. And then I look at rookie defensive backs in a complicated Big Fangio scheme, and I go, ooh, 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 there's going to be some hiccups. <laughs> yeah. Not that it's a bad thing. Right. Because you're going to learn, but there's going to be mistakes. Mm -hmm. And the expectations for first round picks in this league, you know, yeah. 
the first time Quinion Mitchell gets beat, and guys, I hate to break it to you, he's going to get beat. Yeah. Every NFL cornerback does. <laughs> yeah. By the way, in big scheme, it might not even be his fault, but you know how this works, John. You see a clip, and Mitchell's running at a receiver who's 10 yards ahead of him, and you go, oh, what's Quinion Mitchell doing? Yeah. Um, it is a brutal position to play in the NFL. Add to that as a rookie, and in this particular complicated scheme, I, I would love to say, hey, sit behind James Bradbury and Darius Slay for a while. Yeah, I mean, there's a balance there, right? I mean, if you're drafting in the top 10, like when the you know the Eagles getting Jalen Carter last year, you, you expect a top 10 pick to be productive right away, unless it's unless maybe it's a quarterback. But even then, I think you're still most of those guys are playing now, right? Right from jump. So when you're picking at 22, when you're picking in the latter half of the first round, I don't think you can necessarily just expect that this guy is going to come right in and, and play at a quality starter level for a team with Super Bowl aspirations right away. It's just not a fair expectation. No matter how, no matter what, what ranking he had coming on the board in terms of his position coming into the draft. And, and so you get the, you get the benefit of having some veteran cornerbacks to be able to, to mentor him and for him to learn from. So that in year two, yes, I think then you can expect him to jump into a starting role because you do only have these first round picks for four years. And then you can, you have the fifth year that you can give to your, to your first round picks, but you do need them to be productive at some point early on, right? Like you can't, I hear people talk all the time. Well, you know, you project these guys, it's three, four down three, four years down the road. Well, you better know what you have by the time your three rolls around or else you're kind of stuck in no man's land in terms of, is this a guy you want to keep? Is this a guy who's going to be, who, who's going to be somebody that you can count on, on long-term. And that's why you're kind of getting to a point with guys like Nicobe Dean, where you really need to see something here in, in year number three. You know, you, this is, you, you want to draft for the future, but you, yeah. you do need to get some results early on in the process. So you kind of know what you're looking at. Yeah. yeah. All of a sudden the defensive back room, safeties, corners, there's a lot of bodies in there, a lot of young bodies, but a lot of, a lot of bodies. So we'll see how it all shakes out. Uh, John, I want to get your opinion on the third round pick. This one seems to be, I'm not going to grade the player yet. We obviously, like you just said, he has to be developed. We don't know what he's going to be, but, what do you think of the decision there? They they take a developmental type edge rusher, a guy that just transitioned to edge the last couple of years. He played at a really small school in Houston Christian, former safety. What do you think of the pick there to to, to trade back a couple of times and then take a a project at edge? You know it. it without knowing what the Eagles grades are on some of the other guys around the areas where they, where they traded back. I, I don't, I don't necessarily hate the move because what you're taking an upside shot there in the, you know, on, on day two, but I, it just, it did remind me of the Davion Taylor pick from a couple of years ago. Now I know there's differences, you know, he's played, he's played more football than Taylor has. It's a, he's, he's got a different skill set. Um, he, the, this, a lot. There are some analysts out there who looked at him and thought, "Yeah, that's that's about where he would be drafted." And some some thought it was a little bit of a reach for the Eagles. I just, I would like maybe, and maybe I'm a little bit less risk averse, but I I would like a little more certainty. I think at that spot in the draft, as much as you can get it, certainly understanding where you are there. And I just I I feel like the the chances that he becomes a a good NFL player are less than maybe somebody else you could have taken in that spot. So. Don't hate it, but it was not my favorite move of the draft. Uh, I think you better have people in the building who really know how to get the best out of people. Like, what you, if you're taking an offensive line project, I feel pretty good about that because yeah. we saw what we saw right. what Scotland did with with Jordan Mailata. Like, there's certain guys at certain positions where the coaching staff you get a you have a pretty good feeling that they're going to be able to turn them into something. And so I guess, you know, we'll, we'll see whether or not the, whether or not the Eagles have the coaches in place to kind of, to, to bring the most out of this guy. And um, I, I think if, I think we'll kind of have a better idea what we see in Nolan Smith here in year two, whether or not the coaching staff is able to bring, you know, guys like this along. Now, Nolan Smith, certainly a, a much more pedigreed player, it certainly would seem to have a, a much higher, a much higher floor, but can you develop edge rushers? Can you develop these young guys? Can you take the skill sets that they've shown in college and add to it? Can can you add some power to their game? Can you add some different moves to their game in order to make them more well-rounded? Can you make them better run defenders uh, if they have to be on the field in that in that particular spot? So a lot of it's going to be on the coaching and whether or not they can whether or not they can coach this guy up. It's just it's very risky and I didn't love it, didn't hate it. 
Yeah, and your point about the calendar before is very meaningful when it comes to Jalik's hunt, John, because you want to know if you got something by year three. And in the case yeah. of Hunt, the Eagles have kind of admitted this is a longer term project. And we all know even more so for the Eagles than other teams, they like to make decisions early to help out the salary cap and help out the roster building process. I don't, I don't think they're going to know about this player probably till year four. And that's a situation where I don't know if it's their wheelhouse to a certain degree. So I'm with you. It's a little bit more, it, I'm nitpicking. I've said it pretty consistently, but I'm tired of people giving Howie all the credit. He gets enough credit. So I, I would have <laughs> went in a different direction. Um, yeah. But it's not terrible. I can't get right. drastically upset by it. But the calendar, to me, I think that was a a good point by you. That that probably is getting pushed back on Jalex Hunt. And I, I I don't know if that's a situation you want with your third round pick in a, in a best case scenario. Um, what's your what's your favorite day three pick? You know, I it, it's interesting. I feel there's so many. There's a little bit of mixed. Uh, mixed uh, uh reviews on on will shipley i i think if it if he can be a slightly more productive kenny gainwell i i i like that pick um uh but i think you know that's a I high smith's bar the, by the way john that's a high <laughs> no, bar right i know <laughs> and, and i smith and an i smith seems like a fun player i i don't know if he's gonna be i don't know if he's gonna be somebody who sticks around for a long time but um you know i i it seems like they, they need to find something other than, you know, AJ Brown and Devonte Smith, something, something to hit kind of in, in the later rounds. Quez Watkins looked like he was going to be that guy. He really did look like for a few minutes there that he was going to kind of be someone who, who could, who could really give you something as a downfield threat. And it just, it just never materialized. And it seems like they're still looking for that. Somebody who can, who can stretch the field a, a little bit more and take some of the pressure off of, off of Brown and Smith. And I don't expect Smith to do that. Uh, or any other draft pick to do that in in year one or anything like that, but I think he's intriguing, and I, I'm I'm curious to see exactly how Kellen Moore is going to use all these different pieces here uh, that they that they have on offense now. But that was that was a pick I, I liked late. I like taking I like taking flyers on interesting wide receivers late in late in the draft because. You never know. You you might hit on one of those different guys. You get them in the right yeah. scheme. You, you get them with a good quarterback, and you have again two wide receivers that are among the best in the game that that he can learn from. I, I that was a move I liked. I thought that was fun. It's also a good strategy because that seems to be all that college football is producing now is receivers, yeah. receiver, yeah. receiver, yeah. receiver. Yeah. So I agree with that process as well. Um, offensive line, though, the one thing. You know, I, mm -hmm. I asked you at the start of this, you know, if I told you they were getting Quinion Mitchell, Cooper DeGene, adding three picks, you'd probably say, no way. That's crazy. Well done, Howie. Yeah. It also, if I told you there were going to be 24, 24 <laughs> offensive linemen taken <laughs> uh, on, on the first two days of the draft, and the Eagles were 0 for 24, like the worst. Philly slump, what would your reaction have been to they're not getting an offensive lineman in an offensive lineman heavy draft? I I will I would say that well, I think sometimes they really they really do go by best player available, right? And I, I do think that that's kind of I think, you know, how he said to, you know, his scouts too, pound the table for your guys, pound the table for who you like. And, and you know, it seems like they they really did that and they they followed a lot of their scouts and what their scouts like. They they really like Tyler Steen, I think. I think that's the big takeaway from the fact that they didn't get an offensive lineman here, an offensive guard, offensive tackle, uh, because it you do need to to – beef up that area of, of, of the interior of the offensive line. And, and we're really relying on Cam Jurgens to be the Jason Kelsey replacement at, at, at center. I mean, that was the initial plan. And so th that's fine that that's the plan that they're sticking with. That was the plan two years ago when they drafted him. And that's, that's the plan now. So I like Tyler Steen. I think he's an interesting player. He looked good. I think in, in, in training camp last year, I thought he looked good in, in some of the preseason games in which he played. And I think it's good to give him the the I think it's good to give him the the first crack at, at the starting right guard job. I I am surprised though that they they didn't 
take somebody that they didn't grab anybody. And and maybe with that pick where they, where they, where they got Hill, that would have been a good spot to, to instead of trading back, trading back, trading back, maybe if, trade up, maybe go up and grab somebody uh, who could potentially be a part of your rotation here in 2024 and definitely in, in 2025. I just, I have to rely on, on the fact that Howie Roseman had a good feel for when these runs were coming and who these players were, and he must just not have liked anybody. My guess is he would have taken an offensive lineman in the second round. If Dejean hadn't fallen. That's, hadn't that, fallen. that's where I think that's where I think it would have fell. If they yeah. don't get rid of 50 and 53, you know, and Cooper doesn't fall. That, that's where I think they end up with an offensive lineman. John, I want to ask you about the fan favorite pick, uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Everybody's been clamoring for a linebacker all year long, and he's a fifth-round pick, but Johnny Mack and I have discussed extensively this week. He does have a chance to start on a team that does not have a lot of good linebackers. Even though he's a fifth-round pick, there is a path to starting. Uh, what do you think of that pick, and, and does he – help fix the linebacker problems in Philadelphia. Well, it definitely was great value. I, I think people thought he would go earlier than that and uh, maybe not a whole lot earlier than that round earlier than that, but I think it was good value there. It was certainly a feel good moment. Uh, the worry of course is pass coverage. He's not the most athletic guy in the world, but um, he seems to be a really instinctual player. And at linebacker, you can be, perhaps the the not the most physically gifted player in the world, but still be a productive player. I mean, look at TJ Edwards. TJ. That's, what, that's what he reminds yeah. me of. TJ. Yeah. Edwards. yeah. Well, I mean, he's got to get bigger. TJ yeah. rocked up. TJ's bigger, right? Yeah. Well, and T, but TJ got bigger too. I mean, he, yeah. he, be, Oh yeah. He, he got, remade his body here. Yeah. Yep. Perfect remade example his body. of the developmental process. Yeah. Yep. Remade his body, got more athletic. Uh, and, but he still was not going to be one of those guys that's, you know, flying all over no. the field, you know, but yeah, you have a guy like Devin White who does have all the physical tools, but a lot of times doesn't seem to know where to be on the field and 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 what to do. I would I would say all the time. <laughs> all yeah. the time. That's certainly fair. And a guy like Jeremiah Trotter Jr., who does seem to know, have those, have the have that intuition of, of of where to be. And I think when you're when you're playing in space, when you're when you're in the middle of the field and you're trying to navigate all that, I think that's I think that's a valuable thing. So there there absolutely is a path for him starting. And if not starting, then being a really, really important part of the linebacker rotation. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the Eagles bring Zach Cunningham back at some point this off season, yeah. just as another body to have in there. Because again, Nicobe Dean, the big question mark, we just don't know with this guy. And we don't know with Devin white either. It's the position on the team that has the most question marks still. And there really isn't anybody else out there in free agency here. You're going to go out and get, unless some cuts happen at some point between now and training camp or when training camp starts. So yes, there's absolutely a path where he can be a productive player where maybe he can even start. I think if Jeremiah Trotter jr. Is starting, I do think something went wrong. Like, I think the idea oh, here yeah. is Devin yeah. White is starting and Nicobe Dean is starting. Right. Yeah. And that's that's the plan. Yeah. It's not a great plan, but it's and the plan. Said, yeah, and to Xander's <laughs> point, I, I said there's a small path. Everything's mm -hmm. got to go right for Jeremiah. He's got to hit the ground running. He's got to yeah. be spectacular in the summer. Just that the Eagles don't have good linebackers. So if you really show up and perform, they might say, hey, we might as well use this kid because we don't have anything else. Right. Um, but, you know, we'll see Devin White. It's crazy to me. I always go back to Jack Del Rio, because I'm old. But for those who don't know, Jack Del Rio was a heck of a linebacker in his prime, was a Pro Bowl linebacker, couldn't run a lick, and he was a great nickel linebacker. And the reason he was, the pass coverage, played a lot of zone, very instinctive, always knew where to be, and that's a problem for quarterbacks. It really is. Instincts are so important at that position. I think everybody goes, well, Devin White, he can run. And you bring up TJ. TJ Edwards was a top 10 coverage linebacker in football, according to Pro Football Focus. Now, you can hate them. But it, it, generally, when they say you're doing something well, you're doing it well. Whereas Devin White, bottom five, bottom 10 every year. But because he can run, oh, he's a great coverage linebacker. What, 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 at what point does playing on the field and instincts matter, John? Well, and, and with a guy like Devin White, the speed, are, are you 
going to be covering slot receivers running with them step for step 20 30 yards down the field no your your job as a as a cover linebacker you're mostly dealing with running backs and tight ends and number four receivers maybe every once in a while but you're it's instinctual right you want to kind of know where is he coming out of his break which direction is he going to go where you know reading the quarterback reading where the other players are where do i need to be based on where my guys are so much of that in zone coverage is is based on instinct and anticipation and having a feel for for where the quarterback's going to go with the ball where the tight end going to go all of that and you don't the speed is good and the athleticism is good if you have it but the instincts of knowing how to attack the ball how to attack the receiver where to be to step in front of a tight end to knock it away or to disrupt his path in in the in, within five yards you know it's that's the stuff that a good coverage linebacker needs to be able to do and i don't know if jeremiah trotter jr is mm-hmm. going to be able to do that at the nfl level but yeah I don't. having I'm the not. athleticism having yeah. speed just in and of itself it's it's like in baseball if you can throw 100 miles an hour that's great but if you can't throw it over the plate it doesn't matter how fast you throw yeah yeah and the best example recently i would say is michael kendricks who was a tremendous athlete uh probably probably the best athlete they had at linebacker before Devin White. You had to have to go back to Michael Kendrick. He wasn't a great coverage player because he just didn't have a feel for it. Whereas Jordan Hicks, and not that Jordan was a terrible athlete, but he wasn't Michael Kendricks from a physical perspective, but he was really good. Mm-hmm. And he was really good because he knew what was going on. Right. And he knew where to be. Right. I think it's more important at linebacker maybe than anywhere else on defense. Um, but the Eagles devaluing of that position as a whole, they, they, they've thrown us a lot of curveballs, John, this offseason with Saquon Barkley. Yeah. Um, and they said, yeah, we believe in – but they linebacker, nope, we're going to wait till day three. You know, we talked about Jalen Hunt. Peyton Wilson was there. They could have drafted him. He might be the best linebacker in the draft. Had some injury concerns. Maybe that was an issue. Yeah, I look at this team and they got a pretty good plan everywhere but linebacker. When is Howie giving us the curveball? Ever? <laughs> yeah, I think we thought this was the year, right? This was the year they like they identify somebody in free agency and make a make a big money play for them, and it it, it didn't happen. Uh, they they decided to. I think I think they felt like they needed to invest in free agency at edge rusher with with Bryce Huff because they knew they were moving on from Hassan Reddick, and that's still a, that's still a, a a transactional decision that I don't agree with. But yeah, there's I I think Devin White was. It's a fine ad. I don't know. I mean, it, and it could really work out, but we're using hope as a tactic again at linebacker. And yeah, I think I was the one who says hope is not a strategy, John. Well, the actions belie that corollary from from how he's so yeah. far. Certainly at linebacker, they do. At, at linebacker, no, they just, you know, I, I don't know what kind of player they're looking for. I don't think, and I think that's, I think that's what really gets me is, is. They just they haven't found a mix, and, and maybe with Vic Fangio in here, Vic Vic knows what he wants in, in at linebacker, and maybe he's happy. Maybe he maybe he likes what he has to work with, especially if the secondary is loaded and you're going to play a lot of safeties and and, and a lot yeah, of cornerbacks. I think we're going to see a lot of three safeties, and yeah, and I I think we're going to see one linebacker on the field a lot. Yeah. That's my early assessment, but that's a good point as well because. We've always known what type of running back they wanted. They couldn't get him. Christian McCaffrey is their white whale. You got to have pass catching ability. You got to be able to do things in space, blah, blah, blah. We don't know what they want at linebacker other than a Band-Aid. Hope it's Nigel Bradham and plays a little bit better and maybe not beat up Cabana boys. I love I, Nigel. Sorry, that's a shit. Yeah, no, Nigel was a good player. I, yeah. I I think I know TJ Edwards. Maybe he maybe he had his camp set on returning to his hometown of Chicago and he was never going to resign in Philadelphia. But it still blows my mind that here's a guy who's an undrafted rookie that you developed. They obviously I worked know. hard and I I would have taken so much pride in TJ Edwards. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I it's not said, even look. like he got Buku Bucks. No. I mean, they, they, that was a reasonable contract for that productive of a player. But, but Howie's got less of an ego than me because I would have taken so much pride. I would have said, look, look what we did. Yeah. Yeah, and they were like, nope, out the door. 
Yeah. So that was the that was the decision at linebacker that really makes me think they don't know what they want. Right. And and ever since then, they've just been trying to find some combination of players and skill sets that will work without spending money at the position and without <laughs> investing heavily in draft capital at the position. And uh, and, and you know, we'll see it. We'll see how it works here in, in, in 2024. But it's not it certainly is the position with the biggest amount of question marks. Yeah, I guess a third round pick from for Nakobe Dean is the highest amount of investment we're gonna we're yeah, gonna get. Yeah, day beyond if seven yeah, million a year or whatever it was for TJ isn't isn't cutting it. You know, third round yeah. pick. We might have been lucky to have even gotten that. John, I want to get your opinion on a couple of the other day three picks. I'm a big fan of that offensive guard they took from Michigan. Um, did anything else stand out to you in day three? I know it's a depth day, but I did think the Eagles did a pretty good job at getting value, getting potential players that could make a difference on the team. Maybe not this year, but down in the future. Uh, what would you think of the offensive guard for Michigan and the rest of the day three picks? You know, it's again, you're right. It's it's like it's a kind of a roll of the dice with with the day three yeah. picks. Um, you know, Johnny Wilson. Um, Johnny Wilson was day three, right? He was. Uh, yeah, he was oh, yeah. day three. Yeah, right, right, right. Talent there, six eight or six seven receiver. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I like I, I like guys who who are tall who can get up there and make and and hopefully be a contested catch guy. Um, you know, I think I think uh, Trevor Keegan uh, is is interesting. Dylan McMahon, you know, the, the I don't know a lot about these guys, so I I would be lying to you if I said like, yeah, I got, yeah. this guy's got great lateral movement. Oh, all that. Uh, I, but, that's, I, that's our buddy I, Ian Cummings. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I, I mean, give Jeff Stoutland those guys and and let him cook. You know, let him let him see what he can what he can get out of those guys. Like I, any offensive lineman they take on day three, I'm I'm happy with because. I feel like if you've got Statland in the building still, you, he may not be able to turn every player into into a, a pro bowler. But, man, he turned Andre Dillard into at least a serviceable backup at left tackle to the point where he got a big free agent contract someplace else. Yeah, man. Which somebody somebody else right? I think yeah. he was just cut. Yeah. He, he yeah. was, but he got that contract. Yeah, he did. He got over $10 million a year. Yeah, uh, I like got, to believe too. If if they took a guy late and he's an offensive lineman, Jeff Stoutland was the guy that liked something. I don't know what yes. it was, or and we're never going to find that out. But he must have said something that he liked about that player. Yeah, yeah probably. And, and, and round five, you there are plenty of great players who have come out of round five. I mean, it's it was late in round five. It was a, what in the one seventies, I think, uh, is is when Keegan was picked. Yeah, I think so, he went one seventy six, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly, I mean, if we're saying Jeremiah Trotter has a, has an outside chance of starting and, and, and playing well, I think you could look at a guy like Keegan who went like 15 picks later and say, if somebody gets hurt, can, can, can this guy play guard for us for, for a half or for a game or something like that? Can Statlin do enough with this guy, especially when you've already got my when you've got Lane Johnson, you know, when, when you've got Landon Dickerson, when you've got Cam Driggins, you've got all these other guys on the offensive line already, you don't need these guys to be super productive early on. So give Stoutland the projects. Um, let him let him work with these guys and see if he can make something out of it. At least give yourself depth. Make some backups. Give yourself some Jack Driscolls, who at least if a game, you know, if you need somebody for a couple of games, you can put him yeah. in there and it's not going to be a disaster. And that's where I like the Becton move after the draft. They go out yeah. and get, I mean, he's a young guy, played a ton of games in the league already. Um, and he's got crazy physical attributes. He's like six seven or six eight. So I love that. I love that pick from that perspective. Jeff Stallin could can definitely turn that guy to a serviceable backup. Um, no pressure on Dylan McMahon, by the way. At John Stolness, uh, make sure you follow John on X. Read him at uh, Bleeding Green with her buddy BLG. He was on yesterday. Um, Phillies does a lot of Phillies work, but what the Phillies won nineteen in April? Is that a record, John? Did I hear that? Uh, right? They won. Uh, I think they won. They won twenty games in April. 20? That was, yeah, yeah, twenty games yeah, in April. So oh, no, no, you're right. It was nineteen in April because they had won in March and then they had won yesterday. So yeah, nineteen was the most uh, they've ever won in, in in the month of April. Yeah, yeah. So they're they're hitting their stride pretty early. So it should be a fun season with the Phillies. Um, I mentioned Dylan McNan. The the Eagles drafted Jason Kelsey with the one hundred ninety first overall pick back in the day. They drafted. Poor Dylan McMahon, an athletic center at 190. So that's what he's got to live up to. Right. Uh, that's probably the not the future of the happening. position, John. Yeah. The future. There he is. Future. It's going to happen again. Lightning is going to strike. Yeah. But now Xander brings up a good point with Becton. 
Now, my buddy Jeff Mosher brought up, maybe they move him to guard. I, I I see him. He's like, you know, I think we saw him when the eclipse of the sun came. I think that was Makai Becton because that's how big he is. Um, is that their plan? Are they out of the box and saying, this guy's the former number, I think it was the 11th overall pick. He's got tremendous athletic ability. He was with the Jets, so maybe that explains some of the struggles. He had some injuries, and he's going to be, and he wants to be with Jeff Stoutland from all indications to rescue his career. Could you play a six? And he's closer to six eight. The, the the NFL when they do things, they don't round up. So he's closer to six eight than six six, um, six seven actually. Mm-hmm. Uh is that too big inside? Is it is it even a thought? Um, is that their potential curveball to fix right guard? Because I don't think they're as high on Tyler Steen mm-hmm. as other people do. And they want competition. Not that Tyler can't win the job, but they don't want to hand it to him. Yeah. Um, and it might be Matt Hennessy, but you think Makai Becton could be a, a curveball at guard. Could be. I think anytime you're going from an organization like the Jets, who I know people still think they're going to be good this year, and their defense has been good in, in the last couple of years, but the Jets just have kind of been a, a, a more bound organization for a long time to a spot like Philadelphia, where you saw what Jordan Mailata became and how these other guys get developed. Becton has to just be thrilled uh, to be able to go someplace. And, and so... It, I think he automatically gets more confidence coming to Philadelphia just because he. I think he feels like he's going to actually get the best coaching available. So confidence increasing has has a fresh start has to has to feel good. You get a clean slate coming to a place where there are no expectations on you. The first round expectations are are, are not there. You don't have to live up to to all of that. Nobody's expecting you to start this year. So even if you're just a backup, that's that's fine, but you're, you're here to learn and you're here to improve and you're here to grow. So that's, that's an advantage that Becton has now. And the Eagles don't need him necessarily. It doesn't seem like to, to, to be the guard spot. And if things progress during training camp and, and during the off season programs, and, and it looks like they've got something, then there is the, there is that spot available. Yeah. Becton can slide right in there. It certainly could be the curveball that they weren't able to, to get in the draft. Uh, like you're saying earlier that that second round pick, they, they went out and they got a project guy who is still young, has a lot of raw tools. And I think Jeff Stoutland sees a guy like that and says, I can work with that. Let's see what we can do. So, you know, is he too tall? Is, are his arms too long? He's probably more naturally suited to tackle. But I feel like tackles transition to guard a lot easier than guards tra- tra- transition to tackles. And so, um, yeah, I, I think it's possible. I think it's it's certainly a, 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 the potential is there. Do I think it's likely? No, um, only because he hasn't shown it to this point, but I think he's going to get better coaching here in Philadelphia, certainly than he did with the Jets. That would be a big offensive line. If Makai <laughs> Becton's playing guard for the Eagles, but John, I want to thank you for joining the show, man. And make sure you follow John on Twitter at John Stolness. He does great work. Great follow has great opinions on all Philadelphia sports. John, thanks for joining the show, man. We appreciate it. Anytime guys. Thanks. Thanks. John. All right, Johnny Mac, pretty good stuff there from Johnny Stolness. If you guys like John Stolness, make sure you like the show as it's the best thing you can do to help the show reach more people, to help the show grow. Uh, Pretty good insight there. Me and John will come back. We have a short segment, and then we're going to have Bill Calarulo in a little earlier than our normal guest spot. He'll be in at 9, 10. So we'll get Bill's opinion on the draft. We'll get Bill's opinion on some of the things we just talked about with John Stolness. Um, And all that coming up next on Birds 365.